This week we wrap up this series at the feet of the teacher. We've looked at the question, how do I get to heaven? What is the top priority? How do we pray? And this week we look at how much is enough. This week we get to talk about money. This past week, I read a blog by a Lutheran pastor named Jock Ficken, and uh, he's a veteran pastor, and he was talking about his first congregation years ago, and they were in a financial crisis. And on Sunday, he just got up and he said, everybody needs to give more money. <laughs> and after church that day, one of the pillars of the congregation pulled him aside and said, don't you ever talk about money again or everybody's going to leave. Money kind of fits the category of religion and politics. They're very, it can be a very difficult conversation to have. Yet money is one of those things that Jesus talks about quite a bit. We get this parable this week, and then in another month, we have another reading from Luke addressing this topic of money. Now, sometimes we take the edge off by making jokes. A uh, member in my last congregation said his wife is going to have to be buried with a pod because she can't get rid of anything. <laughs> We've seen people who have been buried in Cadillacs. And I read a story once about a guy who wanted to be have all of his assets converted to gold and have them fill his casket with him. And his wife said, I'll just write him a check. <laughs> Money. And yet, even with those jokes, it doesn't quite take the edge off what Jesus addresses to us today. As we hear about this rich farmer who stores things up, and then God says, who's going to enjoy it when you're gone? It's a tough parable. As we live here in the U.S., in the land of abundance, the land of plenty. Each time that Stacy and I have moved, we have filled the better part of a 53-foot semi-trailer with our stuff. We live in a six-bedroom house on a third of an acre with three vehicles. And so as Jesus talks about this rich farmer, he's talking about you and about me. But before we get to that point, this story is precipitated by a young man who comes up to Jesus and wants Jesus to be the arbiter in an estate issue. Apparently he's the younger brother because the older brother was always gets double the inheritance. It's two portions, according to Jewish law. And rabbis were regularly brought in to settle these disputes. And Jesus says, man, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stepping into this. I'm not going there. This guy may want to advance his standing in society at the expense of his older brother. He may be greedy and not feel that he is getting enough or getting his just desserts. But whatever it is, Jesus makes this statement. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. But if we take a mental inventory of our homes, even just of our own closets, there's a lot of stuff there, isn't there? And so what do we make of this story that Jesus tells? Let's hear part of it again. Luke 12, 16 through 19. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Is money the issue, or is his attitude the issue? On the face of it, if we saw somebody that successful, they would be on the cover of Forbes magazine, or they 
might be sharing their wisdom on how to accumulate wealth. What's wrong with being rich? Well, there might not be anything wrong with being rich. Abraham was a very rich man. King Solomon, if his wealth was um, kept up with inflation for today, he would be by far the wealthiest man on the planet. So what is the issue? It's the heart issue. I tried to accent the eyes and the minds in that farmer's response. It was all about him. All about the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. My barns, this is what I will do with what I have earned. He forgets to thank God. He doesn't set aside any apparently to help anybody else. It is all about him. All about his own earnings. As Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 2, What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless. So, what is Jesus saying? Is he saying we shouldn't be industrious? We shouldn't seize the opportunities that God has given? We shouldn't work hard? We shouldn't seek to advance and, and make use of the gifts that God gives us? Are we not supposed to plan for the future? Are we not supposed to put a nest egg away and invest in retirement accounts? Is a Christian financial advisor out that he uh, talks about you know, scripting and saving now so that you can have more later. And he sums it up with, live like no one else now so you can live like no one else later. That's what the rich farmer does. That's what Solomon did. And Solomon said it is meaningless. I think it again gets back to that heart issue. As we hear from Paul, as he writes to the Colossians, Colossians 3, 5, and 6, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. It's not that this farmer worked hard at Jesus' man. It's not that he invested well and had a nest egg and, and was able to afford bigger barns for his storehouse. There's a sense of greed there. Of putting money as his idol. Of putting success as his idol. We all have those things that we try to invest in to make ourselves feel secure and better about ourselves. It can be hobbies, it can be activities, it can be achievements, it can be our bank accounts, it can be our raging good looks, it can be our athletic prowess, and sometimes it's different things at different times of life. But when those things become the driving force in our when those things become the number one thing that we are pursuing with everything that we have, and we forget about the one who gave us the opportunities, who gave us the abilities, who gave us the blessings, then those things are idols. And we're worshiping another God, a God of our own making. As Jesus ends his story in verses 20 and 21 of Luke 12, God says to the farmer, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. 
Instead of investing in his relationship with God, as Jesus tells the story, the farmer was just investing in things that are here and now that one day will either be passed on to somebody else or fade away. So how much is enough? How much is enough? John D. Rockefeller, who lived over 100 years ago, who was one of the wealthiest men in the world at that time, was asked that question on a number of occasions. People would say, John, how much is enough? How much more money do you need? And his answer was always the same. Just 1% more. Just 1% more. It's the human condition, isn't it? Especially here in the U.S., bigger, better, faster, stronger. And yet there's that great Beatles song. I don't care too much for money because... Money can't buy me love. I knew there were some Beatles fans out there. <laughs> right, money can't buy me love. Money has limits, doesn't it? It can't buy us a cure from an incurable disease. Money cannot fix a broken marriage. It cannot fix a broken family. Money has limits, and it's a tool. It's a tool that God gives us <laughs> to use for to take care of ourselves, to take care of other people, and to give glory to God. As the writer of Hebrews shares in Hebrews 13, keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And those words are easy to read here. Keep our lives free from the love of money. Lean into God and the security that he provides. And yet we leave this place and we're bombarded with advertisements and messages in our culture. Advertisers look at what people are insecure about, and they find a way to amplify it and to lift it up. And then they provide a cure for that, right? I mean, think of all the weight loss uh, commercials that are out there, or the commercials that, hey, you know, get this car, or use this product, or do this, and your life will be just instantly better. And that sidelines us into looking at things for solutions. As God's people, we're called to love people and to use things. And yet many times we fall into the trap and reverse those. We love things and we use people. It's a challenge. And it's an age-old challenge. As we heard from Ecclesiastes, which was written centuries ago, and even the New Testament is 2,000 years old. And we continue to wrestle with these things. As Paul wrote to the young pastor named Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, he says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So how does our relationship with God shape our priorities? How does the reality that we are children of God influence how we steward the gifts that God gives us? Those gifts of relationships, those gifts of finances, those gifts of time, those ways that we prioritize things. How do we pursue these good things that God encourages us to pursue? <laughs> Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. It all starts with Jesus. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. It is through Jesus stepping out of 
eternity and into time, stepping off of his throne and being born into a poor family, ultimately emptying himself on the cross for us, that we're truly rich. Having the riches, the inheritance that the king of the universe gives us freely through Jesus. Greed is the antithesis to generosity. And as people who have been given much by God, we get to also give much to others. As we give thanks to God for his many blessings, we seek to bless others as we too have been. Paul writes in Colossians 3, verse 2, he says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. As we sung in our hymn of the day, our possessions are not our own. There is nothing that we have that we technically own. Even if your house is paid off, you don't own it. It's a gift from God. It's a gift that we get to steward, that we get to manage. And it's a blessing. A blessing that we get to enjoy and a blessing that we get to share. So what does it mean to be rich toward God? As Jesus speaks to us, he reminds us of the blessings that we have. And as he continues on in Luke chapter 12, in the verses that follow, he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or, what, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? So where do you find your security? Is it in your bank account, your wardrobe, the vehicle you drive, the house you live in? Where do you find your security? Because as I hear Jesus here, we are more valuable than birds. And we see how God generously takes care of them. So what does it mean to be rich toward God? As Jesus speaks in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, page 15. So I commend the enjoyment of life, because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. As we enjoy the riches that God gives us, as we enjoy the many blessings that come to us in many shapes and forms, Continue to thank the giver of those good gifts, our Heavenly Father, who generously places all of these things into our hands, and then through our hands also blesses 